generation of born soldiers, a generation of born leaders, a generation of born killers. And I'm happy to be part of that generation, brothers and sisters. So as we prepare to enjoy the Black Holocaust, sit back and relax. We don't have nothing to do. We don't own anything out there anyway. We don't own anything. Let's bring on the chairman of the Black Studies Department of Wellesley College, the man who's fighting the onslaught, one of our best scholars, one of our leaders, one whom we choose to back, Dr. Tony Martin. Thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. Thank you very much, Brother Malik Shabazz, for inviting me here for this historic occasion tonight. As Brother Shabazz and others have said, we live in a very exciting time, a time when our people are rising up, a time when we will no longer bow down, as Brother Malik said. My topic for tonight is the African Holocaust. Our people have suffered grievously for the last 500 years. Our people have suffered so much in the last 500 years that it's one of the great miracles of history that any of us have survived at all. <laughs> Our people have survived the greatest holocaust, the greatest onslaught that any people, any race of people has ever been called upon to face in the whole of human history. Yes, sir. Our people have been called upon to face a struggle where other people who have faced lesser struggles have died. As we look around the world today, we see any number of people who have died, who have disappeared from the face of the earth, who had to deal with the kind of struggle that our people have had to fight in the last 500 years. If we look at the Caribbean, 500 years ago when Columbus lost his way and stumbled upon the Caribbean islands. <laughs> He met a race of people in the Caribbean islands, people called Arawaks or Caribs. According to the Spanish chroniclers and historians who came shortly after Columbus, the island of Hispaniola to take one island in the Caribbean was one of the most populous islands they had ever seen. Some historians estimate that there were anything from 600,000 to perhaps 11 million people on the island of Hispaniola in 1492 when Columbus, 10,000 miles off course, stumble upon that island. Yes, sir. Within about 40 or 50 years of Columbus's arrival in Hispaniola, there were a few hundred Arawaks left. A whole race of people had disappeared from the face of the earth. The same thing happened in the other islands. The same thing happened in Cuba, in Puerto Rico, in Jamaica, in the Bahama Islands, later on in the other islands as well. You had a whole race of people who disappeared from the face of the earth when called upon to face the kind of onslaught that African peoples have been fighting for the last 500 years. You look around other parts of the world of the story, this dismal story repeats itself over and over again. You come to North America, to the Native Americans, you go to Central America, to South America, you go to Australia with the Aborigines. Australia, a country which for years was bold-faced enough to have what they called a whites-only immigration policy a country which was once the domain of black people, where they exterminated almost entirely the native black race. You have a case of Tasmania, the large island south of Australia, where every single black, white, black man, woman, and child in Tasmania was wiped out, totally wiped out by the white usurpers. And the story repeats itself over and over again, and that's the kind of beast that African people have been struggling with for the last 500 years. <laughs> a people who have committed genocide, who have perpetrated holocausts everywhere they went as they expanded overseas. Beginning in the 15th century, in the 1400s, beginning with the Portuguese and the Spaniards, later on with the British and the French and the Dutch and the Danes and the others. You can trace the history 
of European expansion overseas by its history of genocide. Everywhere they went, they committed genocide. So I said the only reason why Africans have survived is first of all because there were so many of us to begin with. <laughs> Secondly, because of our great resilience. Yes, we were born fighters. We fought a good fight, a fight that nobody else fought. The mere fact of having survived in that situation where other people succumbed entirely is in itself a great triumph, a great epic, one of the great epics of human history. We survived because we had great enlightened leadership. We have been blessed as a race of people over the years with enlightened, fearless leadership. We have been blessed over the years with leaders who were dedicated to the people, who were honest, who had a correct ideology. In recent years, that ideology has manifested itself in a variety of forms of African or black nationalism. The methods used by the European to exterminate us and to exterminate other people were legion. Sometimes the European waged total war against the unfortunate people they came in contact with. Sometimes they waged wanton destruction. In the case of the Caribbean in Hispaniola, the island which today is shared by Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the Spanish abolitionist priest Bartolome de las Casas tells us that the Spaniards in Hispaniola and the other islands after Columbus waged wanton destructive fury upon the native inhabitants. They would go competitions among themselves to see who could kill the most so-called Indians. They call them Indians. Who could, call, who could kill the most Indians in a day? They would go competitions among themselves to see who among the Spaniards could cut off an Indian so-called head with one blow of the sword. They would gather the Indian so-called notables in a large building, set the building on fire. They would barbecue the Arawaks. 13 at a time in honor of Jesus Christ and his 12 apostles. Kill them, burn them to death, barbecue them. They would, according to Las Casas, they would cut off the limbs of Indian children and throw them to their dogs. Sometimes they supplemented their wanton destruction by the use of disease. <clears throat> the Europeans introduced a variety of new diseases that Africans and, Ab and Aborigines and people in the Caribbean had never experienced before. Smallpox, as you all know from the North American experience with the smallpox blankets, which were given to the Native Americans. Smallpox became an instrument of genocide and destruction. The same was true of syphilis. They blamed the so-called Indians in Hispaniola for giving them syphilis, but in fact, the only documented evidence we have about the spread of syphilis is that syphilis moved around the world in the wake of European expansion. Wherever Europeans went, they took syphilis. If you trace the history of syphilis around the world, you find you can trace the history of syphilis around the world by looking at when the Europeans, quote unquote, discovered any particular area. If the Europeans got to Senegal in 1505, well, that's when syphilis came to Senegal. And if they got to Nigeria in 1506, that's when syphilis first appears in Nigeria. And if they got to South Africa in 1511, that marks the beginning of syphilis in South Africa. Everywhere that the Europeans went, syphilis was originally named after whichever kind of European brought it to them. In some places, syphilis was a French disease because the Frenchmen brought it to them. In some places, it was the English disease because it was the English who brought it to them. In some other areas, it was the Portuguese disease and so on. And in the case of syphilis, you have a most bizarre and alarming parallel in the history of AIDS in the last few years. Syphilis in the 1500s was the AIDS of that period in time. As the Europeans moved around the world destroying, yes, there were collaborators from among the conquered people. Yes, there were African collaborators. But don't for a minute believe, as some have tried to argue recently, that somehow the African traitors who collaborated with the white Jews and Gentiles were somehow equal in guilt to those who brought slavery and destruction to their land. Every struggle in the, in the history of the world has always had its collaborators, its traitors. 
During the Second World War, you had people they called Quislings in Europe, Norway, elsewhere, who collaborated with the Nazis. During the Second World War, you had Zionists, Jews, Zionists, who collaborated with the Nazis. During the American War of Independence, you had Americans who collaborated with the British. Jesus Christ had his Judas. So collaboration is nothing new. But collaboration does not make the primary responsibility. The collaborators themselves were nothing but secondary factors in a destruction which was engineered out of Europe. Out of all these factors came the slave trade. The slave trade was the real crux of our particular Holocaust. Slavery and the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, which brought us here to the Americas. One of the major means of genocide by which the Europeans perpetrated the slave trade was by rationalizing the slave trade. It's very interesting, but even though the slave trade was a physical thing, which involved the total physical destruction of hundreds of millions of our people, an important part of that genocidal destruction has to do with the intellectual pretexts, the excuses, the rationales that the Europeans came up with. Before the Europeans killed us, they, fought, they felt it necessary to justify what they were doing. For a while, they just they justified our enslavement by saying that we were not Christian, we were heathens. Some of the Roman Catholics began Christianizing the slaves, so it became impossible to argue that we were not he, uh, Christians, and that was the reason. <laughs> so they looked at other pretexts to justify the genocide. Sooner or later, they came to the pretext that we weren't human. Thomas Jefferson, the great founding father, he wrote a book called Notes on the State of Virginia in the 1700s, in which he argued that Africans were less than human. Hence, they should be justifiably enslaved. Most of the major intellectual figures in Europe said the same thing. Hegel, great German philosopher, a whole bunch of them said the same thing. Africans were less than human, therefore, they could justifiably be enslaved. In other words, they were setting up an intellectual justification for genocide. The most pernicious of all of these intellectual justifications for genocide was what they came to call the hermetic myth. The idea that somehow we were cursed by God himself. That God himself had ordained that Africans would always be slaves. And the blame for this hermetic myth, which ultimately resulted in the death of maybe 300 million or more of our people, lies with the Jewish rabbis, <clears throat> the people who invented the Talmud. The so-called Talmudic sages, the people who put together that most holy of Jewish books. It was in the Talmud, the so-called Babylonian Talmud, a thousand years before the African slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, that is. A thousand years, three, four hundred AD, that is when the Jewish rabbis, so-called sages, invented the Hermetic myth, put the curse of God on Africans. And that was the myth a thousand years later which was revived by Jew and Gentile slaveholder alike. And that myth became the basis, the intellectual basis, for the destruction of maybe 300 million or more That's of our right. people. That's right. The Hermetic myth came out of the book of Genesis in the Bible. The book of Genesis claimed that Noah had gotten drunk in his tent. His son Ham had looked upon him in his nakedness. Noah supposedly came to eventually and cursed Ham's son Canaan and his children after him for having gazed upon Noah in his nakedness. And there the story ended in the book of Genesis. It was the Jewish sages who then injected a racial component and somehow invented the fact that Ham somehow was the first African and that the curse on Ham in the Bible therefore was a curse on Africans. And it was this curse then which became the justification, the intellectual underpinning for our Holocaust. There are many sources for this information, but the source that I like to quote is one which I quoted here in my book, The Jewish Onslaught, and I'm going to read it for you from the Jewish scholar Harold D. Brackman. Brackman has been going around the country of late, writing letters to the New York Times. I even saw a letter of his in the black press and all, saying that 
people like myself are misquoting him. Brackman made the mistake of writing a PhD dissertation in 1977 from UCLA. His dissertation is called The Ebb and Flow of History. It's a study of black Jewish relations up to 1900. The arrogance and intolerance and ignorance of people who oppress us is absolutely amazing sometimes. <laughs> they feel that they can write things in their books for their own consumption, but they underestimate our intelligence to such an extent that somehow when they write this foolishness in their books, they figure we will never have the sense to go and read the books and quote them. And of course, when we quote them, and when they realize to their great consternation that not only can we read and write, but we are a million times smarter than they are, because let's face it, the intellectual superiority claimed by those who oppress us is nothing but a big bubble. And we are fortunate enough to be living in a time when that bubble is being comprehensively burst. And that's the reason for the hysteria and the madness that we are seeing in the press every day today. That's the reason why day after day in the major media you can see Jewish colonists saying that Jews never enslaved Africans when the record is so clear, so well documented by their own historians. Why would supposedly intelligent people paint themselves in a corner? Why would they deny the undeniable? when the evidence to the contrary is so plain for all to see. Yeah. The reason is because they have underestimated us to such a degree that now that they are faced with the wrath of black intellectuals, they are forced into hysteria. <laughs> Let me quote Brackman for you, and I don't care what he wrote in the New York Times, it's incredible. The ability of these folks to tell lies is absolutely amazing, <laughs> amazing, totally amazing. Sometimes I think that they are totally incapable of telling the truth. Sometimes I think that if the truth hit them in the head, they wouldn't even know what it was. <laughs> Let me quote Blackman, uh, Blackman, sorry. Not Blackman, <laughs> Blackman. <laughs> no way he could ever be a black man. Actually, let me quote myself first in a paragraph before I quote Brackman. Here's what I said when I wrote this book. I said, Brackman probably considers his own PhD dissertation, quote unquote, hate propaganda by now. Let me go on to quote, quote uh, Brackman himself. Quote, there is no denying, this is Brackman now, there is no denying that the Babylonian Talmud was the first source to read a negrophobic, that is a black hating, a negrophobic content into the episode. He is talking here about the curse of uh, Noah, you know, curse of Ham by Noah in the book of Genesis. He is saying that the Babylonian Talmud, the first, if any of you can get a hold of the letter that Blackman wrote to the various papers, go back and read it and you'll see where he is totally contradicting what he himself is saying here. He is saying here, this is Brackman now, that the Babylonian Talmud, the holy book of the Jews, is the first. There's no qualification. He didn't say one of the first. The first, without qualification, source to inject this racist foolishness into the curse of Ham's story. He goes on to say, and here is where it begins to get really hot and heavy. Brackman goes on to say that some of these Jewish so-called sages began to embellished the story as they went along and add little frills and details. Some of them began to say that black folks became black and ugly because of this curse. Black folk got thick lips because of the curse. And black folk got bulging eyes because of this curse. Black folk got black skin because of the curse. According to Brackman, and I know people always think I'm going insane when I say this, but I'm going to quote it for you in a hurry before you think I'm going insane, but according to Brackman, these Jewish rabbinical sages 
even went so far as to say that black men got long penises because of this curse. <laughs> this is the holy book of the Jews now. <clears throat> Talmud. Quote. And here I'm quoting Brackman. And again, this is the intellectual basis upon which the annihilation of 300 million or more of our people rests. This is the pretext upon which the slave trade was built. Let me quote Brackman. Quote. The more important version of the myth, that is the Hamitic myth, however, ingeniously ties in the origins of blackness and of other real and imagined Negroid traits with Noah's curse itself. According to it, that is according to this uh, myth, Ham is told by his outraged father that because you have abused me in the darkness of the night, your children shall be born black and ugly. That's the Talmud. Because Ham has abused Noah in the darkness of the night, his children, that's us, we are his children, according to this myth, will be born black and ugly. So that's the reason why we are black and ugly, because according to the Talmud, Noah cursed Ham, the African, and his children. Yes, sir. Let's look at it, sir. Because you have twisted your head to cause me embarrassment, they shall have kinky hair and red eyes. So that's the origin of our kinky hair and red eyes. It's all there in the Talmud. Because your lips jested at my exposure, they shall swell. So if you ever wondered why black folk had thick, thick lips, there it is. <laughs> and of course, the Talmud, like any good piece of literature, leaves the best for last, it leaves the punchline for last, and here comes the punchline. And because you neglected my nakedness, they, that is the children of Ham, us, the males at least, because you neglected my nakedness, they shall go naked with their shamefully elongated male members exposed for all to see. So there we have it, the origin of the long male African penis. It's all there in the Talmud. <laughs> Could it be a question of jealousy, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just asking. <laughs> A rhetorical question. <laughs> so all of this then was the underpinning for the African slave trade, the slave trade, the worst holocaust in history. The killings began in Africa itself. Lord knows how many millions of Africans died before they even reached the Atlantic Ocean. The historians tell us that sometimes Africans were marched a thousand miles to the coast. They were held in slavery on the coast sometimes for months, waiting a full cargo for a slave ship. The historians tell us that the Middle Passage, when the Africans were shipped from West Africa to the Americas, North America, South America, Caribbean, wherever, historians estimate that perhaps one third of the slaves who were still alive when they entered the ships died before they hit the Americas. One third, a mortality rate of one third. You have horror stories of slaves being thrown overboard. There's a famous case concerning a ship called the Zong, where in order to, to, to forge an insurance claim, a ship actually threw the slaves overboard and then pretended they were captured by pirates or something and you know, made a false insurance claim because the cargo was in, insured. Cargo. Even the terms they used, cargo. You had the beginnings of the rape of African women on the ships. J.A. Rogers tells us that on the slave ships, the sailors would improvise harems, rape the African women. Some of the women would arrive pregnant in the Americas and would therefore fetch more money because whoever bought them were buying two for the price of one. All right. The slaughter, the Holocaust continued once the slaves hit the New World. C.L.R. James tells us that in Haiti, the average life expectancy for a slave who made it all the way to Haiti was six years. It was economically more viable for the slave master to work the slave to death in six years rather than treat the slave well, keep him or her to a ripe old age. 
You know how economists operate. They draw charts and diagrams and graphs and stuff. And they figured that if they worked the slave to the maximum and had the slave die in six years, it would be economically better for them. They would make more profits than if they let the slave live a normal life, sleep eight hours a night, etc., etc., lift to an old age. Because once the slave lived to the old age, of course, then the slave became a charge on the slave plantation. You know. The tortures which were visited upon our people are absolutely amazing. We all know that a whip was the normal accompaniment of the work day of the slaves. Slaves were whipped 100 times, 200 times, 300 times. Slaves were made to walk around with special collars with prongs sticking out. The idea being that they could not sleep. You had this collar around your neck with prongs sticking out. So there was no way you could find a comfortable position to sleep. You know, no matter how you lay, lay down, you know, you, you, you'd be in an awkward position. Your neck would be sore and stiff. Slaves were castrated as punishment. Slaves were dismembered, had their limbs cut off, ears cut off, noses, lips cut off. Slaves were branded like animals. Slaves were often denied the right to, to get married, raise a family. C.L.R. James tells us of a way of destroying slaves in Haiti called burning a little powder in the ass of a nigger, where they would stuff gunpowder into the anus of a slave and blow him up. J.G. Steadman, a British writer who went to Suriname in South America in the late 1700s, he wrote about what he saw there. He saw slaves and he actually drew diagrams, pictures. He wrote about slaves being drawn and quartered, tied to a large wooden structure and have, having all the bones broken with a heavy piece of iron or wood or something. The slave would be stretched out on this rack, wooden rack, and somebody would come and literally break all of the, the slave's bones. There's a picture drawn from life in Stedman's book, narrative of a five years expedition against the revolted Negroes of Suriname. He has a picture of a slave who was hung up, hung up from a gibbet with a hook, with a chain hanging down and a hook through his ribs. His hands tied behind his back and he was left there to hang by his ribs until he died. He, he lay there for about, about a week. Stedman tells us about a large Jewish settlement in Suriname, a place called Jew Savannah where the Jews proliferated as slaveholders. Stedman says the Jews in Suriname were the most cruel and wicked of all of, of, all of the slaveholders. He talks about a Jewish woman who ran a red-hot poker through a slave woman and killed her. Red-hot poker. Stedman tells us about a Jewish slave owner called Schultz, who raped the mother of a young slave called Jolly Care. And the rape of mothers was a frequent occurrence in slavery, not, not only in Suriname, but everywhere the slavery existed. If, you, if you've ever wondered why the word motherfucker has become such a, a term of, of scorn in our community, that's the reason why. Okay. <laughs> Many a young slave child had to witness because the slaves lived in little one-room cabins. And when the slave master came to rape his mother in the night, there was no privacy. Many a young slave child had to witness his mother being raped by some slave owner. And here you had this Jewish slave owner named Schultz. And Stedman tells us that Jolly Care was a child witnessed his mother being raped by this slave owner. Jolly Care grew up to become a leader of the Maroons in Suriname, who waged successful war against the white people. And as fate would have it, the time came when Jolly Care grew up to become the leader of rebellious slaves, and he was waging war against the slave owners, and he captured the same Schultz, captured him, the man who had raped his mother. And Schultz told Jolly Care, well, look, man, I remember you as a kid. You grew up on my plantation. I know you're not going to kill me now. We have a special relationship. I was good to you. And according to Stedman, Jolly Care cut off Schultz's head. He cut his head off and he played bowls. You know, he went bowling with it on the beach. <laughs> According to Stedman, Jolly Care then flayed Schultz, cut the skin off his back, and used it to keep his powder dry in his cannon. <laughs> so that was at least one motherfucker who found his just desserts. desserts. <laughs> So, 
people who ran the slave trade, who perpetrated these atrocities against our people, who committed this holocaust against our people. Yes, we know that Arabs were involved in the slave trade, not so much the transatlantic slave trade, more the slave trade to the east, but slave trade all the same. Yes, we know that Christians were involved in the slave trade. I don't think there's a Christian denomination that wasn't involved in the slave trade. Yeah, we know the Pope was involved. We know there were Jesuit priests in Brazil who had harems of slave women like anybody else. The fact is, however, that as far as I know, none of these people deny their involvement in the slave trade. The only people who deny their involvement in the slave trade and get indignant when you remind them of it is the Jewish element. And if I single out the Jews, it's because they have attempted to deny the undeniable. We are told that in the days of slavery, even though the Christians were the ones who perpetrated the slave trade to a large degree in this country, at the very least, they were heavily represented among the abolitionist societies. We are told that the Jews as Jews were few and far between as far as the abolitionist movement goes. And now that we as African scholars are trying to set the historical record right, we again run into the problem where it is the Jewish scholars and activists and columnists in the major newspapers, they are the ones who have sought to deny their involvement in our slave trade. And their invo involvement, as I said earlier, is well documented. The largest slave ship owner in this country was Aaron Lopez, a Sephardic Jew. Newport, Rhode Island. The second in command of the Confederacy was a Jew, Judah Benjamin, as were many of the leading members of the Confederacy. Some of the major uh, shareholders, stockholders in the Dutch West India Company, major multinational corporation financing the slave trade with Jews. A large number of the slave ship owners, the Portuguese slave ship owners who brought slaves to the Americas were Jews. David Brinkley, and this week with David Brinkley a few months ago, discussing my case at Wellesley College, was talking some foolishness there one Sunday morning. He was saying that Tony Martin is an anti-Semite at Wellesley, he's talking foolishness. He was saying that Tony Martin is saying that the Jews brought slaves to the Americas. And David Brinkley said, he is wrong, it wasn't the Jews, it was the Portuguese. But the damn fool didn't know that it was the Portuguese Jews, they were one and the same. The results of this holocaust in the new world are plain to see. As early as the early 1800s, African Americans were almost 20% of the population in this country. Today, African Americans are something like 12% or thereabouts. Black folk have actually declined as a percentage for a variety of reasons. Part of it is the continuing holocaust, part of it is the infusion of a lot of European immigrants to try and swap the black population. And that continuing holocaust has continued unabated even after slavery. In Africa itself, people forget that even in Africa itself, after slavery ended, the Holocaust continued as, as though slavery had never ended. In fact, it became worse in many areas. In the country they called the Belgian Congo, now Zaire, between 1880 and 1900, the Belgians killed about 12 to 20 million Africans in that one little country, the Belgian Congo. Where is the Holocaust Museum to those 12 to 20 million Africans killed in that one country right. in 20 years? Right. In this country, we had the incredible phenomenon of lynching. From the time this, the Civil War ended up until fairly recently, a few decades ago, almost every single day in this country, black men, women, and children were lynched. They were burnt at the stake. I saw the photograph, as many of you saw, Brother Khalid here um, you know, in the papers this morning with, with a poster of a black man burning, being burnt at the stake. Black men, women, and children were hung from trees, from lampposts. I'll never forget the headline I saw of, of a Mississippi newspaper from 1919. It said, 3,000 will lynch Negro tomorrow. That was the headline. The governor of the state, Governor Bilbo, said he was powerless to stop it. That was the will of the people. What did Europe benefit from our Holocaust? The reason why Europe is preeminent in the world today, economically, militarily, is precisely because of our Holocaust. Europe's ascendancy in the world today was literally built on the blood, sweat, and tears of Africans.
Eric Williams in his famous book, Capitalism and Slavery, showed in minute detail how all of the profits that went to finance the Industrial Revolution came out of the super profits made in trading slaves and growing sh slave grown sugar, cotton, and so on. The slave trade is what made Europe preeminent from the 18th century on, and Europe maintains its preeminence today because of our suffering. That's the reason why we call for reparations today. What did Europe gain from the slave trade? Europe gained raw materials. It gained a dumping ground to send its misfits. Georgia was a penal colony. Georgia was settled by convicts out of England. Australia was settled by convicts out of England. The West Indies, Columbus's first voyage, was nothing but convicts, people on death row. Those were the people who were on the ships. One of the most amazing efforts of Europe to dump its problems on us arose in this century around the effort to find a homeland for the Jews. For many years before they finally came up with Palestine, they were looking around the world and they seriously considered Uganda as a place to dump the Jews. They seriously considered Kenya as late as the beginning of the Second World War in 1939. When the Second World War began in 1939, there was actually a Jewish delegation in what was then British Guyana in South America. And they were getting ready, in fact, they wrote a report, and they were getting ready to dump the Jews in British Guyana. If the Second World War didn't start when it did, you know, who knows, instead of Palestine today, it might have been Guyana. They had maps drawn where they cut Guyana in half, and they were going to give half to the Jews. So every time you see what's happening in Palestine today, you can breathe a sigh of relief and say, there but for the grace of God, go us. <laughs> Did Africans resist? Of course, Africans resisted. As I said before, the reason why we have survived is precisely because we resisted. Jolly Care resisted. Nat Turner resisted. And very often, it was those slaves who had some education, who had what, in the eyes of the white slave owners, would have seemed privileged. Those were the slaves, very often, who made the sacrifice to make common cause with their less fortunate brethren. Denmark Vesey, who led one of the largest, most powerful slave conspiracies in America, was a free man. He was a free man. He put his freedom and his life on the line to go back and raise the slaves. David Walker, who wrote the most powerful indictment against slavery, was a free man in Boston, paid with his life. Nat Turner was able to read and write. He was a literate slave, one of the few literate slaves. When Nat Turner got his little group together, there was a man with him that his confession, so-called, called Will. Will the executioner. And Nat said to Will, why do you come here? Why do you come here? And Will said, you know, my life isn't any more dear to me than anybody else's. I'm going to strike a blow for freedom. Will the executioner. And whenever Nat himself was faltering and hesitant, it was always Will who came up behind and struck the fatal blow. In fact, in the confessions, they refer to him as Will the executioner with his fatal axe. When Nat... Amen. Amen. When Nat Turner was eventually caught, put in jail, tried, sentenced to death, a white man named Thomas Gray went and interviewed Nat Turner in the jail. And in the middle of the confessions, which this white man wrote down, it's very fascinating, but this white man, Thomas Gray, he's in the middle of these confessions, he is writing down Nat Turner's account of what happened, and he pauses and he says, he says, I looked at Nat and I saw this black man there, you know, in rags, fettered, getting ready to die. And I saw the, the resolute power in his eyes, the lack of repentance. And Thomas Gray, the white man said, he said, my blood curdled within me. That was the power of not even getting ready to die. The power, the power of resolution, of truth, that revolutionary zeal. And Thomas Gray asked Nat, he said to Nat, aren't you sorry for what you did? They're going to kill you. They're going to hang you tomorrow. And Nat's response was, was not Jesus Christ crucified? Liberty or death is what Nat was talking about. Finally, let me endorse the call for reparations. Our people have suffered too much. Everybody else has gotten their reparations. As of 1985, the Jews had gotten 
at least $70 billion worth of reparations. $70 billion worth of reparations from Germany. And that didn't include all the billions of free grants and aid that the US government gives them every year. And that didn't include the back reparations that they paid for East Germany when East Germany ceased to be communist. So Lord knows what the figure is today. It might be, it must, must be well over $100 billion by today. And the great irony is that the same people who had gotten perhaps $100 billion worth of reparations for their six million, those were the same people who turned around and went to extraordinary lengths to prevent black people getting even the most measly, embryonic reparations. They were the people who went and entered the Baki court case, the Supreme Court case back in 1977, the Baki case. The Jewish organizations, the Anti-Defamation League, I prefer to call them the Defamation League because that's all they do. The ADL and the other Jewish organizations, they went out of their way in a case that did not concern them. They filed what the lawyers call Friends of the Court briefs to argue against affirmative action quotas for black people. Here were people who had gotten perhaps a hundred billion dollars, not million, but billion dollars worth of reparations, going to extraordinary lengths to prevent African Americans from getting two or three places in a medical school by way of reparations. So clearly, justice is on our side. Like I say, we live in a very exciting time. We live in a time now where we have conquered fear. We live in a time, I believe, when, as James Brown used to say back in the 1960s, you remember he had a song, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Say it loud. In that song, James Brown says that we demand a share. So we are at the point now where we demand a share. We are at a point now where we are no longer afraid. We are at a point now where we have buried or are in the process of burying Uncle Tom. Our liberation is at hand. The 21st century belongs to us. So let the Jews and the Gentiles rage. It doesn't matter. Yes, sir. One God, one aim, one destiny. Thank you very much. Give it up again, Dr. Tony Martin. All right, all right, all praises to the man who speaks, revolutionary research scientist, Steve Oakley. Appreciate you, brothers and sisters. Hotep. Hotep. I'm very honored to have a few minutes just to share a little information uh, with you. To hopefully, hopefully, I can advance the reason why we're here tonight. I especially uh, want to thank uh, uh, Brother Khalid for extending himself out to me today. Uh, I'm honored for the invitation, and I appreciate uh, being amongst such good brothers and sisters. I also see uh, as well in the audience uh, many other uh, outstanding brothers and sisters who on any other night uh, would equally be as honored and as shared. I see uh, Sister Nana Shashibi there from the Pan-African Congress. I see Sister Mary Cox out there, attorney and freedom fighter. I see Sister Deborah 2X was down here from Baltimore. I see Brother Elder Yehuda out there. I see, I know Brother Eric is here from the research brothers and sisters from New York. Brother Steve is here from Dallas. There's people here from all the way from Los Angeles. I really appreciate the opportunity as the focus is geared towards the Black Holocaust. And of course, whenever you have a murder, you must have a murderer. There must be someone who does the murder. So now that we're looking at what was a dead body that has resurrected, we must now find out who tried to put it in a comatose state. For what you will find in all of the people who have come to stand before you as warriors and those of you who are warriors in your own right, it is our goal to pursue the core of negativity. 
We have agreed that somewhere at the bottom of our problem there is a core or a main group of key individuals and institutions and organizations who have pulled off consecutively over the years negative activity against our people without retribution. Part of the failure to retribute has been lack of knowledge. Part of what Brother Malik has tried to do here today is to fill the gap and to provide our people with access to information that is denied. I think what each of these men could vouch for in their moments of greatest attack from the enemy, that in the midst of all the greatest sources, I remember Dr. Jeffries on the Donahue Show pulling up every book of the hunkies he could find to relay that he didn't need dogma or rumor from the black community to verify what was being done to us. They had in their own arrogance and braggadocious nature, they had said all the things we needed to say. And the brother stood there with the evidence. And I remember Brother Tony Martin standing moment after moment, bringing up the names of those people, institutions, historically and current, in his attack on the people who have attacked him. And he knows there was a point when they looked at him and said, you know, it really ain't about the facts. You see, what you have witnessed in the spirit of the scholar, because it alleged that we lacked the knowledge or the information of the fingers on the points of the people who were doing it, was that when the scholars arose with the information, they and I and others found out that they really weren't interested in the truth. It was bigger than that. Just we took the gray area out of the attack and found out that their attack wasn't based on fact. They were, in fact, the haters they were calling us. I recently, I recently had the honor of just leaving the University of Illinois where I went back for free to retaliate against whites who had attacked me. I don't uh, very often talk to whites. I do not or talk to the media, I do not entertain some of the ones I see here today. And as a strategy, one of our cameras must get a picture of all those who are here to take pictures of us. That must happen. We must have always accessible the pictures and the profiles. When Dr. Collett pointed out that Richard Cohen was in the front row, that's when he left. Finger pointing and naming the names does have a way of moving the enemy. So I had the honor after spending two, three hours of dropping Carol Quigley and talking about the Trilateral Commission and the Bilderberger Group and the Skull and Bones and the Rhodes Scholars and the Boule, the little Jewish students the next day went to the newspaper and said that Coakley must have got his information out of Mein Kampf. But no, those were good white scholars because, as I've always said, because we've been so indoctrinated, we know it takes a good white scholar to prove to our people that the truth is the truth us saying it has never been enough and we bore that burden in spite of that and still it wasn't the facts so if it isn't the facts then it must be the force i salute you in the spirit of the bogard because the facts will back up the rationale and but it'll be the bogard that will put it in force Uh, I'm on uh, just quickly tonight to try to uh, add a few names and a few insights. Uh, I'll be here again on June 3rd uh, with the trial of the Oath Takers. I've chosen to attack the Oath Takers because as I've gone from city to city and attacked the uh, Greek connection, I found out that there were oaths and rituals that people absolved, uh, absolved their faith to and support that prohibited them from being ultimately loyal to black people. These oath takers are really not personal, they're institutional. And the army takes an oath, the lawyers take an oath, the doctors take an oath. These oaths, and only in rare case like a good lawyer like Mary Cox and a strong doctor like Dr. Aline, who would break the oath to defend their people first and foremost. These are rare moments in our community, but the oath takers are part of our enemy structure. I know uh, Dr. Collard isn't here now, so I'm going to save my opening for the close because it's something very personal for him. Uh, as I began to come out of college and fight against, uh, I always wanted to be a freedom fighter. You know, there's no spot in our community called freedom fighter. And everybody, if you ask them if they had the choice, if they could fight for their people all day and all night, that this would be one of the most honorable things a person of our race would want. But there is no position called freedom fighter for the right to fight for black people is something that you have to do, as some would want you to think, after you got through working for someone else. But time has passed and the way has been made that more people have come across on their own. 
But when I first started out in the black community in Chicago, I was offered a job at, a, at, a, at an organization. It was called the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs. It was headed by a white man named Milk Cohen, who recently died, and a white woman who is still active in Chicago named Jane Ramsey. I say that because every time we say a name in front of the hunkies who are here to report on what we say, tomorrow they will report to those people that their names were mentioned. And this is the type of tension we need to put on the enemy. You might not know all who they are, but they'll spend some time defending them tomorrow when we've called their names in front of you. So that will make the offense spend some time defending the things that they have come to offend us about. So, but what I found out was that the black community in Chicago was being watched that the only way you could effectively pull off a holocaust on a group of people in the now society is to try to watch the emergings of them, the organizing and coming together of them, the projection of values and strength by them. Those are the things that the enemy sticks his thermometer deep down into our tongues and up our butts to find out when it is and what it is they think they can pull off. In Chicago, I found this early warning system. It was funded by the United Way. So today, I suggest to you, if you're going to stop the black holocaust, you're going to have to stop the good hands of the United Way. I say that because, and listen, I'm going fast, so we don't have no time for applause. I bring the United Way up because it was the United Way that formed an early warning system, which is what the spy thing is called, an early warning system, my eyes and ears are listening post these adjectives. And this early warning system had formed a coalition which was to monitor what was going on in the black community of Chicago. And they went out and empowered 25 organizations to be snitches against the wishes of black people. And even though the goal of this project was to monitor developing racial tension and to take advanced intervention when necessary, listen to the language, they only watch black people. But deep inside the early warning system, I saw people from the Urban League. I saw people from the NAACP. I saw Operation Push. I saw the United Church of Christ. I saw many people who I got slightly confused by because I didn't understand why any 18, 20, 30, 50, or $100,000 was worth a person crossing their own people unless they felt that their own people didn't know enough about how they did the damn spying to fear the people catching them. So I started off with a little two-page document that started to describe how the Anti-Defamation League, and this is I found them in 79. They got caught in 1992, but I caught them in 79. It just took a long time for the people to believe that Brother Coakley was as credible as the district attorney in San Francisco. And each and every one of these brothers up there, I saw huge extensive profiles of Dr. Collard in that 900 page document that the white district attorney of San Francisco had to turn in to a black judge, to a judge to get the right to raid their offices. And when they asked them to raid the offices in Los Angeles to find where this information was duplicated and located, the black police chief wouldn't assume his own authority and transact the raid. They had to call in police from another district because the black man didn't want to defend the names that he saw in the list. And even though there were some whites in there, there were names of black people like those up here who wasn't worth him going to defend. Reason I say that is that we're pretty mad at the white guy, but the white guy we might not see to the last moment. In fact, I had this dream, this fantasy. We got Rockefeller over here, we got Oppenheimer over here, we got Rothschilds over there, and we got the noose right here. And the crimes that had been read out before the people, and I know it was a little white guy here from Australia. He said, Are you Steve Coakley? I said, no, he went that way. But I turned to the brothers in the back I was talking to and I said, you see, that guy, he come over here from Australia because the reason he want to know is that his godfather is Harry, Ernest, and, uh, and what's the other Oppenheimer, uh, Harry Jr. Those are his godfathers. So when we stand up and say that the man who helped today enslave New Zealand and enslave uh, uh, Australia and enslave all of Africa is led by the Oppenheimer family. Yes, they will come from the BBC and the CBC and the Australian news to hear that the names of the hunkies who have hidden for so long are now on the street in DC. They're on the street in LA. They're on the street in Kansas City and Detroit and the little people have decided that the big ones are not going to make it. So I want to say a name or two so that the whites will go away and effectively spread the cancer to the others that we mentioned their name. 
Now, there was a case that the Anti-Defamation League had spied on the brothers and sisters, even 12,000 people in organizations. But what you don't know is how it was that the case was settled that the Anti-Defamation League did not get criminally and violated. There are some weird white people out here, and I want to tell the whites that they're whites who are leaking information about them every day to people who they believe have the courage to use it. And whites had made claim that the Anti-Defamation League of the United States works right through the National Security Council. And when I did a little check over at the National Security Council, and I remember when they said they were spying on Chris Honey when he came over here, and I tried to figure out what the connection was, then I looked up and found that the head of the African desk of the National Security Council is a white man who's named David Steinberg. Now, David Steinberg's name ain't never been mentioned in the history of the black community since he didn't took that position. He know that. But today, we introduce his name into the arena as a group of people whose names must never be forgotten. And you should take the time to look him up in your phone book so that you know when you, where he lives, where Jim Woosley lives, who heads the CIA. Where does Warren Christopher live, who runs the State Department? The CIA jams Africa through the embassies in Africa, and that's where they hide the CIA. So Warren Christopher and the Deputy Secretary of State, Strong Talbert, and Peter Tarnoff, the former president of the Council on Foreign Relations, who's the third in command at the State Department, those names should be in the forefront of you, as well as Winston Lord's name, as well as David Ross's name. And of course, I want to repeat again David Steinberg because it was him who got the Anti-Defamation League out of that criminal case when they spied on other people. Two things I want to leave you with. One is on July 8th to July 15th, Brother Coakley is having a conference in Baltimore. And the reason he's having a conference in Baltimore is because it appears as if there was a mistake made by the Hyatt Regency Hotel in the harbor there. And it looks like Brother Coakley and the Boule, Sigma Pi Phi, are going to be having a convention at the same time, July 8th to July 15th in Baltimore, Maryland. Oh, oh stop, now stop, stop, stop. Don't waste my time. And how many of you? Since LA is coming, Detroit is coming, Chicago's coming, they have the furthest to come, it will cost them the most to get here. But the key to the bottom 10, for the first time in the history of our race, brothers, the bottom 10 is gonna meet the top 10. And I know, I know, I done drew out a lot of strange occurrences on this, because everybody don't want everybody to know how clear the top 10 works on behalf of protecting the honky. But we have resolved the riddle of their Grecian Sphinx, and now the day has come that the bottom 10 must confront the top 10 to protect the safety and sanctity of the race. This must happen. How many of you would be willing to come to the Hyatt Regency in Baltimore during this 10-day period? All right, stop, stop. I'll be downstairs. I'm in a booth downstairs. We can talk about that. My tapes are down there, and the other vendors down there ask that we make sure that they know that you know they're down there, and they need your support, too. Last thing. It would be a great remiss if we didn't take our chance to put on the record that we wanted to enforce some retaliation against the enemy. And around this country, in fact, just two weekends ago here, the Republic of New Africa, which I was on a forum with, in fact, with Brother Chokwe Lumumba, they ratified a resolution that I proposed, which was for economic sanctions against non-black businesses for the months of November, December, and January. This must be. This must be. Now, I've been attacked right here in the black press for suggesting that in Washington by the Negro element in African clothes, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, stop now, stop now, stop now. But I need you to understand that when the hunky walk away and he said, well, what did they say they were going to do? He writes it down. Sometimes that's the vaguest of all the lists. We must, and I ask you to ratify a resolution that calls for economic sanctions against non-black businesses for those three months because that's the months that 60% of all goods are sold and if we were to ever to punish the whites, this is something anybody can do. All you gotta do is hold your pockets. You don't even have to say nothing. You don't have to believe in it. You might not be spending nothing no way. At least take pride now in not being able to do it. So I hope all of you would be willing to do that so that when they go away, they know it's some economic retaliation on the buffer. And in closing, 
The New York Times, almost a year ago today, April 18th, 1993, Sister Nana openly advocated the recolonization of Africa, and I want to say fuck them just to that, because, oh, stop, 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 because the audacity of trying to draw a question about our brother and his statements about Africa, when in fact you were on the record a year ago yesterday, Colonialism is back and not a moment too soon. Some countries are not yet fit to govern themselves, and then they end by saying, we gonna get Africa. So I know that, brother, you stepped on a wire of theirs that they didn't really want attention being focused on, but we wanna let them know that we have not forgotten them and that we know them with the Council on Foreign Relations, Foreign Affairs, openly advocating a year ago today, we're gonna make Africa beg to be recolonized. I don't know if you know about the past Holocaust, but you better, Dig in and get ready against this now one. There's some now people who feel so arrogant and so alone that they can openly do this just with whites and think we're not listening. So we'll put the pressure on them. And one last thing. Brother Khaled, do you remember when we were in Atlanta at the Revolution 101 conference? And at that conference, we were sitting down and looking at the Anti-Deformation League's um, uh, attack on uh, uh, black leaders. Uh, Brother Jeffrey's in there, uh, Brother Martin will be in the next one, uh, Brother Malik going to be in the next one. Uh, but when we looked at that report, you looked at me and you said something that I mentioned to almost every audience I go to because it touched me personally. You said, brother, you were looking for your name. And you were looking and said, damn, I ain't got but two paragraphs. You know, we're talking. And, uh, no, he said something that was very heavy. He said, one day my son is gonna look at me and say, Daddy, why you only got two paragraphs in the destruction of the enemy? And he looked at me and he said, Brother, shit, I got to do better than this. <laughs> he did, he did. Well, brother, I know that Brother Malik and Brother Martin and Brother Jeffries and you too, Brother Collett, you have made your sons and your daughters proud. You have earned your spurs against the enemy. Thank you. Once again.